Hey everyone, welcome. I appreciate you taking time or during your lunch hour to, to listen to what I have to say. Um, and today we're going to talk about the Catch My Breath program. Uh, it's one that's near and dear to my heart because I've been uh, interested in e-cigarettes since about uh, five years ago when I started thinking harder about the effects of e-cigarettes on children and youth as, as well as, as their Excuse me. Is there utility as a cessation aid, uh, aid for adults? So we're gonna we're gonna talk about the Catch My Breath program, but I want to give you a little bit of background about e-cigarettes and, and where I'm coming from. And uh, for those of you who attended my webinar a few weeks ago about uh, what's called what's the big deal about e-cigarettes, I covered a lot about what they are, uh, what's in them, and the harmful constituents, and any potential problems that might occur if uh, children use them versus adults. So I'm not going to talk too much about that other than give you an orientation in the next few minutes. If you're interested to take a deeper look about uh, e-cigarettes and the health consequences, you, you might go to our msdcenter.org uh, website and you'll be able to find the previous webinar and the slides attached to it. Um, and in that, I will say, in that uh, webinar, I, I mentioned a report which came out in uh, uh, December of 2016 by the Centers for Disease Control about e-cigarettes and then a second one which just came out a few months ago in January 2018 the, from the National Academy of Sciences. Both of those reports are, are free. You just go to their website. If you uh, Google National Academy of Sciences and e-cigarettes you'll find it. You can get that report and, and, and look at it yourself. But anyway, uh, let's move on here. Um, I, first, I should say that I'm uh, spe I've got two hats today. I'm a little schizophrenic at times, so uh, but thanks to quantum physics, I can be in two places at the same time. Um, uh, I am one of the original uh, uh, individuals that helped form the Catch Global Foundation, and uh, thank you, Catch Global Foundation, for for helping with this project. Uh, the Catch Suite uh, of uh, health promotion materials for children and families and communities has been around for, for a very long time, since the early 1990s. Uh, yet uh, four, almost five years ago, we started the Catch Global Foundation, which uh, sole mission is to uh, promote and disseminate uh, the Catch series or suite of programs um, to, to schools, particularly focusing on, on uh, underserved or low-income schools. So thank you to Catch Global Foundation. If, if you Google them, you'll find more about them. But I also work, my paycheck comes from uh, University of Texas and the School of Public Health and the Michael and Susan Dell Foundation. So all three of those organizations are, are wrapped up into this talk and, and I work very closely with, with all three of them. Um, so there it is, the Catch Global Foundation and some of the, uh, the board of directors is Peter Cribb and uh, Ernie Hawk, myself and uh, Duncan Van Dusen is the executive director. Um, so there's a, a number of uh, early founding partners which included MD Anderson in the RGK Foundation, as well as the Michael and Susan Dell Foundation. I'm thankful to all these organizations and University of Texas to helping launch this uh, program, uh, Catch My Breath. I, I'll say that we, we also have Catch Preschool, Catch Elementary School, Catch Middle School, Catch High School, um, an oral health version of Catch for kindergarten and pre-K kids. We work with diet, physical activity. In tobacco primarily and, and we partner with MD Anderson for sunscreen prevention too. So we, we and myself know a fair bit about kids and the things that uh, might be helpful to them in terms of prevention and their families and caregivers. This is just a, a little note <clears throat> about the Michael and Susan Dell Center for Healthy Living. We, we do research then we translate that research and try and disseminate it. So we're in the middle of doing both uh, research efficacy testing of Catch My Breath and to disseminate the program too at the same time because there, there's such urgent demand from schools uh, throughout the country as I'll share with you in a minute. So what is Catch My Breath? It's, it's a best practice based, based youth e-cigarette prevention program intended for kids aging uh, 11 to 18 and that's mainly for middle school kids through high school. So why, why are those the years that we picked? And, and that's because most children start experimenting with tobacco at around sixth grade. Now, uh, there are probably some kids in fourth and fifth grade that might, but it's a fairly small percentage, and we haven't quite gotten around to figuring out the ideal program for a fifth grader. The, the danger is you don't want to give a fifth grader or younger too much information. You might accidentally make them interested in the product in the first place. So you have to be cautious. And, you know, we're, we're also cautious with our sixth grade program, too. By high school, most kids, and middle school, too, I'll say, 
um, they, they know about e-cigarettes. But, you know, in, in about 2010, 11, there was a, a rapid increase in the, the use of e-cigarettes over time. Uh, and that, you know, myself as an epidemiologist and a public health professional caused some alarm. I was invited to help edit the Surgeon General report, and that's the report in the gold box that you see. That's a cover, e-cigarette use among youth and young adults. So that's a reasonably comprehensive view on what was known, at least in 2017, at the end of the year, about the harmful consequences of, of e-cigarettes, particularly as it pertains to, to young people. Um, so anyway, so I was one of the the, the members of that certain general report, and as I was reading, I got very interested in, in you know, if, if this is going to be as big a problem as it seems it's going to be, then there needs to be some kind of public health response. And, and for my own world, uh, I know how to write and design and evaluate curriculum, so we made the Catch My Breath program. Um, and amazingly, um, without... I mean, yes, we do have a diligent effort behind this, but uh, be, because we're in many, many schools and, and we have a, uh, a list of uh, people who use all the suite of catch projects or products, uh, we got phone calls and emails and text messages from people all over the country saying they wanted to do something about e-cigarettes because schools are confiscating the devices. They, they, they may not know what they are or how harmful they are. There's a ton of misinformation that's, that's out there about what, what, what we know about it. So, so our current program outreach is uh, within a couple years of releasing this program, 30 states uh, at their, uh, well, 30 states have said, you know, we'd like to see these materials and, and make use of them. Um, 200 or more, and, and we get probably five, 10 requests a week at Catch Global Foundation to, to join this program and, and become involved in it, uh, reaching approximately 50,000 kids. So in a couple of years, that, that seems like a, a pretty big number to me in my experience in schools. It, it's an indicator of uh, a strong interest. Uh, and that's why I decided to do these webinars, is to just, just kind of let you know what, what I know about this um, and give you an opportunity to uh, ask questions uh, via the, the webinar format in the chat. And we'll get to that in just a little bit. <clears throat> so as of right now, the catch... Global Foundation received a grant from CBS Health, the, pharm the pharmacy company. And you, you may remember that CBS was uh, uh, really a, a leader in, in amongst uh, people that, that sell pharmaceutical products uh, commercially and uh, deciding to, to not sell tobacco products. That, that was a bold, big step by them uh, a few years ago. Maybe some of you heard about it. But in addition to that step that they took, that really put them on the map for you know, ignoring profits, potential profits, and, and in favor of uh, you know, endorsing healthful, healthful products, um, that they put a fair bit of money into a program uh, that they call the, Bur the Be the First Initiative. And they've contracted with agencies like American Lung Association and Tobacco Free Kids and a few more, and, and they knocked on our door. I'm really happy that they did that because there, there's not that many other programs like Catch My Breath right now, uh, there's, there's a couple more out there, I will say. Um, but, uh, you know, we've been working on it. We have a platform to deliver it. And you just saw that uh, a lot of people are actually using it. But they gave us $500,000 to offset the cost of the program. So as of right now, if you're a listener, you can go to the, uh, the catchinfo.org or catch.org and, uh, and, and get a, a version of this, <clears throat> not a version of, you can get the program uh, for free. It's underwritten by CVS. So if anyone from CVS is out there listening, uh, hats off to you for, for doing this initiative and for supporting this program. I, as, as one of the originators of it and writers of it, truly do appreciate your, your support. Um, our goal is to reach 2000, 200,000 kids by 2020 under this particular initiative. It will go on for a couple more years. So just as a way of background, there was a concerted effort in the public health and tobacco control community to reduce the rate of youth smoking. And uh, this is a little data from the Youth Risk Behavior Surveillance System. Uh, there's other surveillance systems that go back to the late 70s. And, you know, I graduated high school in 1976. And I think the number then was more like 60% of teenagers in high school uh, were regular smokers. So it was normative to smoke, is normative amongst adults and for kids. And that number has been going down, down, down for 25 years or so. And you can see here, and we start charting at the end of the 90s, that it, it 
it continued to go down, and, and those are really good numbers in terms of smoking rates. So this is current cigarette use. Um, now, you can both uh, uh, feel good and bad. So the good news is um, that the smoking rate is, is going down. The cigarette smoking rate is continuing to go down. Uh, the bad news is it's being replaced by e-cigarettes. So the question we have on the table, is that a good thing or a bad thing? Now, you know, I would prefer, I, if I, I mean, I hate to even say it that way. I, I don't prefer that kids smoke cigarettes, but I guess if you have to pick between the two, you'd probably pick an e-cigarette over a regular cigarette. But in actuality, you, you shouldn't do either one. So I, I wrote this program uh, designed specifically for e-cigarettes, uh, thinking that uh, there's more e-cigarette consumption than there is regular cigarette consumption, and that we needed to reformat it uh, to specifically address this versus add it on as a, a long list of, of other things that uh, current uh, tobacco uh, prevention programs do. So most tobacco prevention is centered on, or at least in the classroom and at school, centered on, on combustible tobacco cigarettes. And then they'll also talk about cigars and snuff and chew, uh, hookah, uh, and then e-cigarettes too. I think e-cigarettes are different enough. They deserve their own topic category. So I'm not saying you should replace with Catch My Breath your tobacco prevention program. And, and we've added some elements uh, to remind kids during Catch My Breath that cigarettes are, are definitely bad and not good for you. So, so anyway, that's the reason why. So we've gained popularity. I do think that e-cigarettes are not safe. While they might be safer by many metrics uh, for regular combustible uh, cigarettes, they're, they're clearly not safe. So let's get that out front. Um, so, but there is hope. We've, we've seen a little bit of decline in regular smoking and e-cigarette as of 2016. Um, but the modern thing in the future data from 2017 is showing a slight increase yet again. Uh, here, this slide is, is showing you, um, just putting it into context of a number of different substances that, that students in high school, in middle school, 8th, 10th, and 12th grade, um, choose to use. So you see that uh, cigarette use in eighth grade in the blue bars and 10th grade in the red, uh, and then uh, 12th grade in, in the green, that of course it, it, it increases as kids get older. So you know, we, what we want to do is start in sixth grade before they're, they're even in that blue eighth grade bar, um, but then concentrate our efforts in middle school um, and, and we deserve some high school, I mean, kids deserve to get more information in high school as well. Um, we can see e-cigarettes are, are bigger, um, clearly than cigarette use. Uh, we can see that some kids are, are using e-cigarette-like devices to vape marijuana. We can also see, and, and we all know this if you've been in the field at all, and, or if you grew up even, <laughs> um, that uh, drinking alcohol is, is fairly normative in, in high school. But this is a slide about being drunk. So 20% of high school seniors almost are reporting that they've been drunk in the last two weeks. So it's not ever using uh, and then marijuana and hashish, we have a pretty high rate of that use, too. So e-cigarettes and vaping kind of go together because uh, some of the devices, you, you can use both of them in it. Um, but uh, just, just for sake of saying, you know, if we're going to concentrate on substances with kids, we probably want to have some type of prevention efforts uh, at school or at home or in community organizations, media messages, uh, et cetera on all of these topics, uh, particularly uh, 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 drinking and driving, which is, is very dangerous for kids. Um, I could have talked about you know, heroin and uh, opioids and other things, but they're, they're a much smaller number than, than these. As if you look at sheer numbers, they, these are the problems that, that we're faced with, um, not to minimize if someone is, is addicted to heroin at, at age 14. So, so what we did is we, we created the program, we pilot tested it with a bunch of teachers. I, I showed the program to teachers and they gave me direct feedback written right on the program materials. Um, then we asked them to go out and teach it and they did that in uh, seven, seven different states. Um, and they, they, as they taught it, they wrote down what worked and what didn't work and we went back and revised it. And we did that over again and we went back and revised it. Um, and, and after we rest, find, found ourselves at a more more final resting place. And by the way, we're still going to get a bunch of feedback this uh, uh, spring from schools, and we're going to revise it again this summer. So it's sort of a continuing process, although I do like what we have. So don't be afraid of using it now because you got to teach something, right? So we, we've cross-indexed it uh, to Texas uh, educational standards. And just to let you know, it falls under the health information 
and I've highlighted this uh, in, in red, uh, health information, critical thinking, health behaviors pertaining to addiction, tobacco, prevention of tobacco use. Uh, most states have added e-cigarette to these sorts of guidelines. And I know teachers, you, you want to know whether these uh, programs that you teach are, are related to your own state guidelines. These are just Texas's, by the way. So uh, I'm sure that is true in, uh, in your state as well. And if you're in a state where we're working with you, we'll, we'll probably um, uh, help you figure out which ones pertain to you as well. Um, further, here's influencing factors. The relationship influences individuals' health behaviors, personal interpersonal skills, refusal skills, benefits of various health behaviors, choosing not to smoke. All these are elements. Um, well, they're in their state education code for a reason because it's evidence-based strategies that have been shown to work. Um, we've also aligned the catch uh, my breath with national academic standards and common core standards too for, for the uh, middle school years. So <clears throat> Texas, just by way to say that uh, to take Texas state legislature in 2015 uh, and then later again in uh, 2017 has issued guidelines specifically for, for e-cigarettes and it makes a recommendation that, uh, that SHACs, what are our school health advisory councils, and, and almost all states have them if they receive federal funds for uh, school food service, uh, they'll have a, a state SHAC, a state SHAC and uh, a school district SHAC. So this is advice made to SHACs that they, uh, that they provide information about how to prevent e-cigarette use. So if you, if you use this Catch My Breath program, you'll be meeting the intent of, uh, of at least the Texas state SHAC. Um, I don't know about other states uh, for sure, but I, I do know that there's common law now in all 50 states which prevents the, the, the sale of and consumption of uh, e-cigarettes with children under the 18 and younger. So you're, you're likely to have this in your shack if you go and look at your rules uh, and stay outside of Texas. Um, you know, this was the focus of last, uh, the last webinar, but uh, just briefly, e-cigarettes in general are composed of a battery. Um, uh, some sort of thing which will battery provides the energy to heat some uh, heating atomizer thing and then there's a cartridge uh, which which contains the uh, um, what they call e-juice which is composed of nicotine and propylene glycol flavorings and, and a variety of different uh, oils sometimes vegetable oil too so this is an, a quick tour of what 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 we're talking about and then here's a, a picture of a variety of different devices um, I, I highlight this one, and, and char, sorry, uh, Jewel people, if you're if you're listening to this, um, I'm going to pick on you for a little bit. Um, uh, first of all, you can see it, it's a pretty cool looking device, right? I mean, hands hats off to you guys and your design team. You've done a, a, a good job with making it convenient, making it look good, making it easily accessible, uh, all those things. Um, the little problem that, that we have is that uh, kids, uh, teachers think it's a thumb drive. It looks just like one. Uh, they don't know quite what to do about it. This is uh, the schools that I've been talking to. This is by far the favorite uh, device that uh, high school kids are using and some middle school kids, too. So that that makes a target, even though um, there's laws which prevent the sale of it. Um, kids are apparently not having trouble finding it. So here's here's my problem, Jewel. And I know that's also your competitive advantage. So you're, you're in a, a tough spot um, when we look at what we might classify as uh, the concentration of nicotine in the e-juice that I just talked about. Um, if it's uh, usually in, in the scientific world and in many other areas too, it's measured by milligrams per milliliter. So three milligrams per little milliliter is, is low. Six is or very low. Six is low. 12 is medium. Um, 18 is high. Uh, 20 is, is considered very high by the European Union. And in fact, that's their standard for the maximum allowable rate of uh, nicotine concentration in e-juice. In the bottom in parentheses is the weight um, per volume. So uh, 2% of nicotine, 5%, sorry, I forgot that percentage sign, um, 1.8. The problem I have with Juul is they come at 59. They advertise that you get a, a, a heavy jolt of nicotine and that is true because I've smoked a Juul and, and it, it zips right through your body almost immediately with the, with a single puff even um, and uh, uh, that that's a lot of nicotine uh, for a child to, to, to deal with um, 
so it's about three times as much as what's allowed in the EU. Uh, it's higher than, than most available uh, commercial products that uh, are in cartridges and such. Uh, however, I'm sure you can get even higher than 59 if you went to a vape shot and have, had them mix up your own e-juice, which not a lot of kids do. Um, they're preferring the cartridges and such. So, so anyway, um, that's too much. I'd say 59 is too much. So how much is too much? I think 59 is too much. Um, and, and the EU says 20 is the right level and also is considered high. Just, just to make you aware, this is like a public advisory. There's 8,000 flavors-ish. Uh, we, we know this from lots of research. We also know that if you look at the advertising of uh, e-cigarettes, some of the same, same strategies which were used uh, to, to make uh, cigarettes seem glamorous are, are now being used for e-cigarettes. Uh, there's also a use of uh, sexuality uh, to try and get someone's interest and to try and make them look cool and pleasurable and, you know, the, a cool thing to do. And, and I will say that the jewel is is uh, people think it's cool. Um, so let's just go quickly. The health effects, and this is the whole webinar from a couple of weeks ago. So there's harmful effects of nicotine. I can't go into great detail about that quick here, but uh, it is true. Nicotine uh, uh, can cause addiction in kids, particularly at, at high levels, like I just mentioned. Um, and there's a differential effect for kids versus adults, a separation of age in the 20s or so. So the younger you are, the more harmful nicotine is to your developing brain. Your brain finishes developing at or about in your 20s. Um, maybe around 25 or so. It's a little bit different for everybody, but clearly it happens in your 20s. So if you start smoking nicotine past the age of 20, the health consequences are, are fairly small. Okay, they're fairly small with the caveat of certain exceptions. If you uh, smoke too much of it, you can have nicotine poisoning. Um, if you drink the e-juice, that's bad for, for anybody, although even worse for, for young kids. Um, and if you've had a heart attack, uh, it might excite your heart and blood pressure and heart rate. Uh, so those things are contraindications. But as far as I can tell, nicotine alone isn't isn't that bad uh, as compared to, to kids where we, we really do have some developmental problems and effects. Um, probably the worst thing for adults with nicotine is if you and there are studies that, that do look at this. If you're a smoker and you add the uh, uh, e-cigarette into your portfolio, you, you might quit. But it's more likely that you're just going to add um, an e-cigarette, e-juice, uh, to your routine of tobacco smoking. You, you, you won't get the experience of getting off nicotine altogether because you're staying in the nicotine ball game. So if you're an e-cigarette e smoker and you fully convert to it, many people, when they run out of e-cigarettes, will turn right to a cigarette and then they're back in the cigarette uh, mindset and, and, and ha habit. So there, there's still a lot left to be known about e-cigarettes and, and quitting smoking, but there's a little bit of danger that way, too, that you might keep smoking in part because of an e-cigarette. And, and that, if is proven, it would be a bad thing. Now, nicotine is the big deal, to me at least, uh, for kids. We do not want them becoming addicted to nicotine because that will permanently change their, their appetite for nicotine you know, for a good long time. Some would say for the rest of your life. There's other unknown effects of, of the chemicals that are in there. So when you heat up a propylene glycol and the flavorings and the oil, um, as well as the, the nicotine, uh, it has the potential to uh, change the molecular structure and convert into something that, that you really don't want. Th this happens at, at higher temperatures. It happens when the device is not uh, functioning properly. So it's, it's not as common. Um, uh, I mean, it doesn't happen with every single puff, let's say. Uh, in terms of these unknown other things. And the, the other problem is we don't fully understand all the possible, all the possible harmful consequences of ingesting something in uh, an aerosolized, uh, quote unquote, vapor form in your lungs versus uh, eating it. So propylene glycol is used in many, many different food products and cosmetics and other things uh, with, with safety uh, established by the EPA, no, FDA. Anyway, so there's unknown effects, and so we're just going to have to live with this a little while until we can figure it all out. Uh, and then a second problem is it might re-socialize, or third, uh, youth of tobacco use. And, and, and this is my being a bit hyperbolic, uh, I will say that. Um, 
Occasionally they do blow up, although I think the industry has taken care of that uh, as fast as they can. No one wants to see this picture, um, but I just have to show it anyway because it's kind of interesting. All right. Can they hear this? I can't hear it. You can't hear it? Excuse me, I just wanted to show you a couple different uh, short videos. Um, and I thought we tested this, but I am not hearing it, so I'm just going to move on. Uh, they're just examples of uh, PSAs which are out there in the field. Um, and we didn't make this one, but you know the program tries to collate these, find them, uh, and then make them available. So Catch My Breath, as you'll see in just a minute, is put on a digital platform, which is intended for teachers to have access to. So they have at their fingertips, if you have a computer in your classroom, and most classrooms today have this, um, uh, we will put the program materials up there, but we also encourage, uh, uh, after the completion of the program, to show these uh, videos that we've uh, curated and selected. And this is one of them, and then there's another one here, too which uh, I'm not going to show since you can't hear it. Apologies for that. These will be found. We could put these, these will be in the slides. Mm -hmm. I know they worked on my computer, and I don't know why it's not working now, because it did <laughs> not too long ago when we tested this. But anyway, so uh, I think I've talked enough about the, the problems with the e-cigarettes. Uh, sorry, the middle point is, is frequently forgotten that uh, there is profound effects of exposure of nicotine uh, uh, for babies, uh, in the mother's nicotine will cross the placenta, and there's well-documented uh, harmful consequences of nicotine exposure for, for baby. So clearly, uh, do not use e-cigarettes if you're pregnant. Um, in fact, in, uh, even though I, I like that the European Union has set the limit at 20 mill milligrams per deciliter, <laughs> sorry, at, at 20, um, they also are encouraging pregnant women to shift from smoking to e-cigarettes. And I, I kind of think that's a mistake because even though you screen out many of the harmful uh, uh, constituents and chemicals from switching from a cigarette to e-cigarette, you're still exposing the nicotine. And, you know, the, the, the strongest link to many of these problems um, that, that happen in, in utero uh, is related to the nicotine. So... You can better think twice about that. If I had to pick, if there was no other possible solution, yes, I would say use an e-cigarette than a regular cigarette, but use one at a lower nicotine concentration for sure. Um, but I would not like to have to make that choice. None exposure is better. Okay, back to the program. So it's based on uh, social cognitive theory uh, by Albert Bandura. We've used that for a lot of different uh, programs which are intended to get at the, the social causes of uh, why uh, kids choose to, to use a substance or not. It's used with adults too, by the way. So it's, it's a well-used uh, theoretical perspective. The program focuses on, on normative beliefs held by kids. We're gonna try and tell them what, what is a, a correct norm uh, we use uh, skills to resist peer pressure, and we help them understand how advertising is designed to under, undermine credible health information. There, there's a lot of misinformation out there, and there's a lot of information which is not circulated by advertising, too, so it's an incomplete picture. And we try to create favorable attitudes and beliefs about e-cigarettes. Uh, the program is divided into four sessions lasting 35 to 40 minutes each. Um, originally, I wanted eight sessions. Uh, but the schools told me that it, they just simply cannot devote eight sessions to, to e-cigarettes. So we, we chopped it into four and squeezed it down into 35 to 40 minutes. Um, there's a, a long list of supplemental activities, too, in addition to the, the actual curriculum, which is that four sessions. So trying to keep it alive a little bit throughout the school year is, is the preferred way to do it. Um, we've also learned that uh, one lesson a week for four weeks is about the optimum number. We don't recommend you teach all four in one week because uh, there is a little bit of homework and group work outside of class. We use a variety of different um, uh, learning uh, strategies, cooperative learning in groups, group discussions, goal setting, interviews. Uh, the, so one of the assignments is to go and interview a parent or other adult about uh, tobacco. And then also, you know, a, a good dose of looking at uh, what is mass media, where does it come from, what's the objective, et cetera. So it's designed to be taught by <clears throat> middle and high school teachers. Uh, often it's the PE teacher. Um, I've seen it taught in a gymnasium with lots of kids, or I've seen the PE teachers go to the classroom. 
Um, different PE teachers in a large school might rotate through and teach the class at different grade levels. I've seen it taught by tobacco education counselors and nurses. So we, we've got a, a lot of uh, easy to understand materials and all of it's been turned into PowerPoint slides. So literally all you have to do is walk in the classroom. If you've got a digital classroom, open up the slides and start talking. Um, if you'd, Once you've done it once and you've run through it, uh, it's not that hard to, to learn it and keep doing it. We have some supplemental materials like posters, which could go in the classroom or in the hallways. Um, we're working with the uh, the UT School of Communications and, and helping us find you know good messages. And the one on the left, as you can see, everyone knows about otters and how cute and, and lovable that they are, as well as cats. Um, so just a short review as what you would see if you opened up the, the, the digital platform um, in catch.org. So um, all the materials are, are set like this, and, and here it is, a description of it. You can download it yourself. Um, you can see here the variety of different things that you'll see. We've broken it into, um, here's, a, excuse me, let me get my mouse going. There we go. Program overview, training. Um, current training is 55 minutes. We're going to try and cut that down to 30 minutes this summer as we analyze our data from the spring implementation. Um, there's a, a session for the teacher. We, we ask that you select a, uh, some peer facilitators in the classroom. So we break the class into groups of you know, as many groups as you has kids with uh, four, four kids about. Um, so you need to get those kids ready to uh, expect some of the activities, which are typically brainstorming and then reporting. Uh, so the, the, the uh, peer group leaders will ask a question to the group. The group will discuss it. The peer group leader will write it down on a piece of paper, and then you come back as the whole class and talk about what different groups found out about. It's a very common strategy for teachers. Um, you, you all probably do it in one form or another. So each session has an activity for the peer leaders to do. So session one, two, three, about advertising, and four, your own life. We ask them to make their own media campaign so that they at least get a chance to, to make some conceptual or even create a, a, a program that could be then shown, um, you could select uh, the best one in the class and have uh, parents or teachers or maybe community members come in or the principal. Anyway, we have a section for parents, so you can send out handouts or email them to them or put them up on the school website. Uh, each lesson has what I call Teacher 411. If you're really interested in this topic and you, and you want to learn more, I put a lot of different websites and, and other resources available. Um, it's up to you whether you want to, to go a little deeper into this topic or not. We have evaluation tools, <clears throat> which are right there. We have intercom uh, or annou morning announcements. Um, and, and this is a, 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 another prog program that I worked on called Aspire. Um, I worked on this with Alex Prokhorov at the MD Anderson Cancer Treatment Center. Um, and it's a, a program for smoking cessation, cigarette smoking cessation, and uh, cigarette prevention, which is completely online. So if you need to teach or you want to teach or you don't know exactly what your school can and should do, we created this program so that all you'd have to do is uh, make an assignment for kids to visit the website, work their way through the program. Uh, after they complete some short assessments, of uh, just making sure that they're actually doing the program, and they can print out a little certificate so that the teachers don't have to do anything at all. Aspire is also in the process of, of uh, adding a, a greater amount of e-cigarette, electronic cigarette, and other new, new products uh, like little cigars uh, and things which are becoming more prevalent into it. So, so I, I think a, a great combination is to have Aspire and the Catch My Breath program. And, and good news, the Aspire program is free too, uh, supported by MD Anderson. Um, after we implement the program, I, I also created a PE supplemental program, which, in, which I know a lot of gym teachers, PE teachers will teach the classroom materials um, in a classroom or try and squeeze it into their, their, uh, their uh, basketball court or sporting arena um, with the larger number. But I, what I did is I, I took most of the materials and most of the activities and I transformed them into activities which could be done while the kids are actually moving. So you can you can run games uh, or other things to get the content across. So the best of all possible worlds would be one where you teach the program in the classroom or even the PE teacher in the gym in one semester. And then the second semester, you repeat the content, which is in a different format 
while the kids are moving and jumping and playing. So that would be a good healthy dose of e-cigarette prevention. I should also say we have different program elements for 5th, 6th, and 7th grade and ninth grade too. So it, it, it has a, a bit of a scope and sequence. So it's, it's in, but yet the activities have changed enough that they're not completely repeating, you know, each year. So the kids see the exact same. So you're not going to see the same thing in seventh grade they did in sixth grade. Um, and we also have more posters and signage. This is just what session two would look like as an overview. We have some te cheaper teacher preparation. Um, you can print the lesson plan yourself or you can click and get to the, uh, the PowerPoint slides. Uh, and so on. So most most teachers will, will that we've observed will, will just walk up to their podium and open it up. Um, there'll be some introductory slides. The teacher then tells the kids to get in their peer groups, leave them run for five, ten minutes or so, and then have a, a large group come back. So it's as simple as that. We got some a bunch of teacher feedback because a lot of teachers are doing it. So most of them felt that the program was culturally appropriate for white, black, Hispanic kids. Uh, most of them felt confident after the training, the one-hour training, that they could actually teach the lessons. Most felt that they, they liked the resources and that there's no need to go a lot deeper, even though I could. <laughs> there's a lot to know. Um, but anyway, so they, they liked the resources there. 73% uh, liked the peer group facilitation, which is a little higher than I thought because it's, eh, well, it's just a little bit different and time-consuming. Um, and they said 70% almost of their students, this is middle school students, like the lessons, which I take as a big victory because it's hard to please middle school kids, as you all know. I've, I've raised four of them, so I, I not only do I see them in the classroom. What did the students say? 86% said they're likely, they are less likely to use e-cigarettes. 82% said they look at e-cigarette advertising differently. 86% said they increase what they know. 70% said they've discussed what they learned with their families or friends, which means that they did the activity intended to be done uh, where they interview a family member. Um, so our, our strategy right now, we're almost done, uh, is to raise awareness as part of what this webinar is about. Um, uh, uh, for those of you that feel comfortable, I'd appreciate you to you know, visit our catch.org um, uh, website where uh, there's a lot of information about e-cigarettes or visit the Michael the msdcenter.org website and 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 connect people to this presentation um, uh, we're interested in, in recruiting teachers to, to help us uh, to build consensus uh, we were continuing to offer training via webinar and, and these will be available and live on uh, we want to implement the program we want to monitor the program make sure it's working well for you there's a uh, ample opportunity in the online website for you to leave comments and you know every week we gather in the comments and as a team we, we talk about them and decide how to make changes that are suggested so these are really valuable methods for us to hear what you've got to say um, anyway so if you're interested go to catchmybreath.org um, and you can enroll and just go ahead and give it a shot. You know, there is still time, I guess, uh, in this school year. We're almost to testing, or many schools are in the middle of testing. Um, I think uh, late uh, uh, April or early May would be a good time to find four weeks to do this program. Uh, and those of you who are running summer session programs, too, summer school for middle school and high school kids, I think that would be an appropriate time to do it as well. Um, lastly, here's, here's what they did in 2015 in the state of Texas. Uh, in most states, as I look, the CDC keeps track of this, so most states have something similar to this. Um, and uh, there's a, the school where my son goes to, I gave a, a talk about e-cigarettes, and they let me know that they put this language directly into their uh, uh, student handbook that, they're, that they uh, show the parents and have the parents sign. So this is just sample language that you could use, um, and they also have decided to implement Catch My Breath. Uh, as well as have me come out and give a talk to their parents and teachers. So what is this one? Just a further explanation about the handbook. Oops. And then I'm going to stop here because we're still, I've been using this slide for about four or five years, we're still in the middle of not <clears throat> fully understanding in, in excruciating detail the level of danger of, of e-cigarettes. It's, it's all too easy to say, ah, just forget about it. They're easier. I mean, they're, they're, they're not harmful. Um, but we know that in some cases they are, particularly with nicotine. 
and uh, uh, just don't think the younger generation needs to be addicted to nicotine or, or at least encouraged to do so. We need to put a wall between them. Uh, adults can do what they want. I've heard lots of reports from the field from people that uh, get a little bit mad at me when I talk about e-cigarettes, but um, uh, that they have used them as a successful, finally a successful strategy to quit. And for that, I applaud e-cigarettes in the e-cigarette industry, um, but that's not always the case, and there are a few downsides to consider too. So let's open it up to any comments or questions. Let me see. We're going to open it now and see what's going on. Yeah, Brooke says you can't hear the video. Um, you know, Melanie Kleiman says, Do, does CVS require branding symbol on their handouts, posters, or the PowerPoint? And um, you know what? I don't know the answer to that. Uh, I don't think so. Um, I, I know that there's someone from Catch Global Foundation on this call. Maybe you can... Uh, leave a message for me to read to the group or put it up on the website uh, if they go to there. Any other questions? Yes, I knew Brooks was listening. He says, no, CBS does not require branding. Thank you, Brooks. By the way, Brooks Broward is uh, one of the uh, communication uh, executives at the uh, Catch Global Foundation. All right. Is your PowerPoint available to take print and to take the Shack meeting to see if we want to proceed with this program? So, yes, the PowerPoint will be online um, at uh, msd.org. MSD Center. I'm sorry. MSD, MSD Center, no spaces, dot org. It'll reside there. And um, so you can you can get it there. I think the, a similar, if not the same PowerPoint, will also be found at uh, uh, Catch Global Foundation. But I encourage you to, to to just use this material as as much as you want. It's there for you to use. Okay, I'm not seeing too many more questions pop up. As I'm waiting for any final, whoops, here's one. Lena, uh, is the program only designed to be implemented in the school setting? Dot, dot, dot. I'm not seeing the whole thing. Can you click on that? Yeah, uh, I don't I you know, I don't think it's limited to the school setting at all. You know, if, if you're running a youth group, um, I think it'd be perfectly fine to do that. I think you could talk about it in sport teams. Um, so there's I, I think it's perfectly appropriate for a number of different settings. Uh, I choose school often because that's where most of the kids are. You know, certainly in uh, elementary, middle school, almost all kids are in some school format. Um, in high school, after about 10th grade, they can start dropping out. So you do, so you do this, lose some high-risk kids. But, you know, if you're working with any youth organization, the 4-H could use it, the YMCA. We work a lot with YMCAs where they deliver our programs. Um, if you're a homeschooler, I think it would be appropriate to, to work with this as well. So I don't see any limitations that way. Uh, think of it as a foundation uh, that will provide you with information to feel comfortable and confident in what you're saying with this topic um, and a foundation of materials for you to present to them uh, and to have a dialogue with the students and uh, kids that you're interacting with. Okay. Our program is available to medical providers without enrolling in the program. Um, you know, I don't know exactly the answer to that. Uh, you know, see, CBS is supporting uh, people to, to get into it. So I don't know, uh, medical providers, if you're, I don't know how you want to use it. That sounds like an offline question. And uh, if you go to the Catch Global Foundation website, uh, you'll find someone to talk to there because I'm not sure exactly how you, you intend to use that. I, I, I don't, my off the top of my head would be that, yes, it would be possible, um, but it's it's a little bit different than what I'm normally accustomed to. My end goal is that everyone can have access to these materials. 
and uh, thank goodness that CVS is, is supporting it. it. You know, it's not that expensive a program to begin with, um, but there are some costs with putting things up on a digital framework. Uh, you know, if things go wrong, if there's uh, operation computer systems, operating systems that, that don't, are not compatible with yours, you know, we have people to answer questions about that um, and, and so on and so forth. So somewhere that, that needs to be supported. That So for right now, CVS is, is doing that support. Um, when their funding ends, we'll have to find another source of it. So eventually we might need to charge schools. I think we were thinking at one point before CVS came on board of uh, $25 per school for year of use, so as often as they want. So e even if you had to pay for it, it's not that expensive. Okay. Include any components on secondary prevention that help prevent e cigarettes from progressing to combustible, combustible cigs. So that's in Seguin. Good old Seguin. I like Seguin, Texas. Um, thank you for that question. Let me make sure I understand it. Secondary prevention. Um, you know, that, that's, a good, that's a good question. You know, we, we haven't focused specifically on that, but the, since you've mentioned it, uh, that is an area we need to pay a little bit more attention to and to make some specific program elements. I think, you know, in, in general, going through the program, there should be a point at which if you are a smoker of uh, e-cigarettes, that uh, it should be obvious about the effects of nicotine that you wouldn't want to do it. So it, the same argument goes with e-cigarettes as with regular cigarettes in terms of you becoming addicted to it. And we do talk a bit about moving on to combustible um, but uh, that that is a, a separate piece, and it it probably deserves its own its own um, program elements. I'll get working on that, Seguin, because I like you guys so much. Okay, I'm going to call a close to this. I'll leave you with one message. I, I read a, a paper recently. That's that's part of my job is to monitor the literature. Um, a recent paper that came out this spring said that there were measurable quantities in the urine of e-cigarette only smokers, which are also uh, carcinogenic properties that are in regular cigarettes. So this this type of research in trying to understand what's possible when you smoke an e-cigarette. Now, granted, the measurable quantities of the carcinogenic or cancer causing uh, chemicals was at a lower level than a regular cigarette, um, but it was a higher level, noticeably higher level, than if you don't smoke at all. So what what is the amount of this toxic or, or carcinogenic chemicals, and how long do you have to be exposed to it before you get cancer? That's a question we cannot answer right now. So, of course, the safest bet is to, to not do it at all. But, you know, that's a choice that people get to make on their own. Um, when we think about children, I think differently, though. So parents get to be the uh, regulators, if you will, of what their kids do to a certain degree, as long as, you know, they know what their kids are doing and they have a good communication strategy with them. But, you know, when parents assign their kids to a school in a public setting, the school has a responsibility for taking care of that child as if they were the parent. And the inherent and implicit assumption in that sort of social contract is that they will try to keep them from doing things which will harm themselves. And, and e-cigarettes fall into that category. So I, I do think that in the state education code supports this, that uh, schools should do something with regard to e-cigarettes. Um, and that something could be catch my breath. They could, they could choose something else if they wanted, but there, there's not that many programs that are available um, and I'm hoping you'll pick this one because we wrote it and, and we feel good about it. Anyway, seeing no further questions, I'm going to call an end to this. And once again, if you just join, these materials will be found on the MSD Center, msdcenter.org. Uh, you can visit that and, uh, and pick up these slides. They're not there right now because we still have to wrap this up and it takes a, a little bit to, to transfer it to the website. It'll, it'll be there probably by tomorrow, I would say. Anyway, thank you all very much for your, your attention, and uh, good luck to you out in the field, and uh, you all have a, a great day.
拜拜。